Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of the mindrenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I am very pleased to welcome to the show for a second time, Laura Maxwell, who is a spiritual counsellor and founder of the Christian ministry, Our Spiritual Quest, which is based in Scotland, but has a global reach. Many years ago, Laura and her mother were involved in spiritualism, during which time they were taught that Lucifer is God, a particular kind of spiritualism there, which we talked about in the previous interview. But now committed to Jesus Christ, Laura ministers to people who are involved in, or indeed who have been involved in, the occult and the New Age and various other new religious movements, and her work now appears worldwide via satellite, TV, radio, books, magazine, and online. And I'm just going to break into that because I want to check with you, Laura. Do you still do the, the radio program on Eternal Radio? Um, that's just finished. It lasted for just over three years, but there will be a new program starting on Eternal Radio with myself soon. And this time I will have a lovely new co-host to join me. Excellent. Okay, well, I'm glad you explained that because otherwise I was just going to go straight into what I said last time and it wouldn't have been quite accurate. So, yes, <laughs> something to look forward to there, um, a new format for your program. Well, anyway, thanks very much, Laura, for coming on again. It's very good to speak to you. Well, thank you very much for asking again, Julian. It's good to be back on. Well, the previous conversation, as I just mentioned, there was, of course, your testimony, which was really quite dramatic in a number of ways. And of course, I can't guarantee that everybody who's listening to this particular program will have heard the previous one. But I do think it's quite important, actually, before we get on to today's subject, which I shall announce in a few minutes from now, Mm -hmm. that people do have some idea of where you're coming from and what your experience is, because it is going to be quite a difficult subject to talk about. Um, Mm -hmm. So if it's okay with you, would you give us just a brief overview of your experience? And it can really be as brief as you like. Yeah, well, I'm almost 50 now, but when I was growing up, for much of my, especially teenage years and in my 20s, my mother and I were involved in all sorts of mystical, paranormal, supernatural, new age, spiritualism type of activities. So we believed in speaking to the dead, uh, channeling spirit guides and so on. We attended spiritualist church in Scotland, and it was very much a part of our life psychic experiences and so on we were in touch with these so-called ghosts of the dead and so on for many years until things started to go wrong and made us wonder if there was something else actually happening instead basically we began to get attacked by these so-called ghosts and spirit guides and so on it really got quite out of control long story short my mother ended up committing suicide because we just could not get help from these tormenting spirits. Mm. Uh, I eventually met a Christian. She told me that I could get free by calling on Jesus Christ and, and, you know, becoming a Christian, which I did. And true enough, I did get free. And it turned out those so-called ghosts and spirit guides were, just as the Bible describes, actually demons pretending to be ghosts and at the name of Jesus Christ they showed their true colours that they really were demons and they fled were the cast out of me and cast out of my home and that's been 20 years ago now since then I've heard the same type of story time and time again and as you say I help people throughout the world who have been through very similar Mm. Excellent. Um, and of course, as I said before, I'm going to recommend anybody who's not heard that previous interview, please do go back and hear that because, of course, there's so much more information in that conversation. And we go into quite a lot of detail and asking many questions about what those experiences actually were, how they could be discerned to be indeed spiritual rather than natural experiences. So we went into all that. So I, I do uh, recommend people to, to listen to that particular conversation back in the archives. Now, today's subject building upon that previous conversation is, I think people will have picked up from the title. In fact, as we speak, I don't quite know what the title is going to be, but whatever it is, they will have picked up from the title. Quite a difficult, quite a sensitive subject that we're going to be talking about. So we're going to be treading quite carefully on this. Anybody who's listened to The Mind Renewed for any time will know that I'm not in the business of being sensational. I'm not dealing with this subject because I want to get people's attention. In fact, to some extent, Mm -hmm. quite reluctant. And and you know this, Laura. I didn't jump at the the opportunity, did I? I, I, I wondered quite how and whether this should be a subject of conversation. But I think it is. You persuaded me that this is actually important to talk about. Um, So the subject is sexual encounters with or the fact that 
there are people reporting that they believe they have had sexual encounters with what they claim to be ghosts or what they claim to be aliens or spirits, whatever they might call them. And that may seem very, very odd. It seems very, very odd to me. But there are people who are reporting this. And they have been for very many years, as our conversation will make clear. That's the subject today. Now, you alerted me to this. So I'm going to ask you this first question. Why does this especially bother you, Laura? Isn't it something that can just be left to these sort of peculiar corners of, of human life? Why are you wanting to address this at all? Well, you know, Julian, you, you echo my own thoughts for quite some time. I was reluctant to talk about it too, very resistant to it. When I did feel God was nudging me to talk about it, I really was not looking forward to it at all. I was uh, afraid people might think I was being a sensationalist. Yes. Uh, but I looked into it more and I realized that there really is very few Christians talking about this and kind of similar to my own background and so on. I feel that because it is such a real phenomena that quite frankly people do need to be informed a little more about it because it is dangerous and, and many people are badly affected by it and actually we need to know a little bit about it just so that we can help others when they tell us about this. So I think this is maybe the fourth or fifth interview I, I've done on this topic and you know like yourself the other hosts felt Yes, it's a very, very delicate subject, but, you know, we kind of do need to talk about this, actually. Mm. Okay, so if we start this from just a technical point of view, um, I think that's quite an important thing to do. Mm. We're not trying to be sensational about this whatsoever. So this, I understand, this does appear under the phenomena of spectrophilia. Mm -hmm. Strange name. Uh, one of the paraphilias, one of the unusual expressions of human sexuality that's just a, a way of classifying it. Now, I get the impression from what you have said in previous interviews that when people claim that they've had an experience with a ghost or an alien, you would dispute that. And if there is any kind of supernatural thing going on, you would say that it's not a ghost, it's not an alien, it is in fact an evil spirit. Do you want to tell us what you mean by an evil spirit and on why they would present themselves in such a way that people would say, oh, yes, it's a ghost or yes, it's an alien? Sure. And I think it's important for me to emphasize that, you know, when I talk about this, I'm not in any way judging people who are involved in this. You know, I used to be a spiritualist myself. My mother, she was a practicing medium and she actually claimed to have had sex with spirits. In fact, she claimed to even have been raped by them. So, you know, I, I'm not pointing the finger, I'm not judging, mm. I, I'm just sharing the insights I have gained about it and from what the Bible shows because I, I now am a Christian. And basically, you know, even people who don't believe the Bible, if we put that aside for a moment and just look at it from the, the kind of experience myself and many others have had, one of the very key and interesting factors is that many times when people are approached by a so-called ghost or spirit or spirit guide or alien, and especially if they're actually attacked by it or sexually assaulted by it, if they actually cry out on Jesus Christ, the very saying the name of Jesus Christ, actually any of these entities reacts to and very often quite violently, and leaves, just vanishes. So that in itself, um, that anecdote in itself would imply that these are not just merely dead people or spirit guides, um, and that the name of Jesus Christ does make them leave, and that the Bible does say that any of these types of spirits are actually known as demons or fallen angels, which are basically evil spirits that are under the control of Satan, that can transform themselves into looking like the ghost of your dead gran or, or a spirit guide or an alien. And because they have all this psychic information, as it were, they can perfectly impersonate your dead gran. They know all about her life and so on, and they can be extremely convincing. So that's what I believe is happening there. 
Mm. Uh, there's one case which may come up later in our conversation has been in the news in the last few months where a lady said that she went to a, an old house in Aberystwyth, I think it was, and uh, she saw this picture on the wall of a very handsome young man from the early 19th century. And obviously she was very enamoured by this picture. And anyway, she claims that she had some kind of sexual experience with the ghost of this man subsequent to seeing that picture. So from what you've just said there, presumably you would believe if there was some kind of supernatural thing going on there, it would have been the evil spirit taking that information Mm -hmm. that she was enamoured by this picture and impersonating that individual in order to Mm -hmm. get into her life, as it were, and affect her. Absolutely. And, you know, these demons, these evil spirits, as I say, they have what you could call psychic information. They're able to tap into information within a local area because there is that spiritual network, if you like, of the demonic. Um, They can communicate with each other and pass on information and so on. And the person who they are appearing to, they can get information about that person. And that's why they're able to be extremely convincing and why many people do believe that they are in touch with these so-called ghosts or spirit guides. Okay, well, let's move on then to the kinds of phenomena that are claimed. Now, no doubt this will be vastly broad because human beings are very different and have different experiences. But the kinds of things that you alerted me to, and I've looked at the links that you sent to me, various experiences which are like sexual encounters, normal human sexual encounters, But in some ways, they're different. They don't quite fit with that normal description. So could you give me, could you give the the audience, you know, some kind of idea of what kinds of things are reported? What kinds of experiences and sensations are reported by people? Yes, well, oftentimes it can begin in the form of dreams when the person is totally asleep and the dream can seem really quite vivid and quite real and that seems natural enough and nobody would really suspect anything strange was going on there but then often it progresses to where when the person is coming out of sleep or just going into sleep they literally feel the presence of someone in the room they may see a a figure of a shadow and literally feel the bed clothes move their clothes move and feel pressure on their body feel a a strange energy in the room and literally feel as if, yes, someone is there and actually touching them and beginning to have sex with them. Um, But often they'll say it doesn't quite feel as real as a human partner. Mm. Um, It feels more soft and yet still an energy and etc, etc. But it is very real and they will say that many times. This is the thing that actually strikes me as an alarm bell. They say many times the sexual encounters with any of these entities is far, far more powerful than what they've ever had with a human. Mm. Mm. Straight away, that would make me question the true identity of this so-called spirit. Because why should a human being, once they're dead and, you know, apparently coming back as a ghost, why should it suddenly mean they have a better sexual Mm. performance? To me, that, that just shows you that Hey, wait a minute, there's something quite supernatural going on here. Mm. So, so yeah. Uh-huh. Right, yeah, I, I see what you mean, um, but it could point in two different directions. I mean, there's a possibility here that we are dealing with something entirely psychological. If I go to the case, and I've just found the lady's name here, Sean Jameson, this is the lady who claims that she had this sexual encounter with this 19th century man. This is from Wales Online, December 2017, it was reported. Mm-hmm. And she was in Aberystwyth. And um, it's interesting here, she said, I woke early one morning to find, and then she describes this man who was in the painting. Um, she said, I told myself I was dreaming and rolled away from him. And then she says, I slowly realized I wasn't asleep. And then she describes, I felt a hand on my waist, but the touch was strange. Okay, so the, the kind of thing that you've just described there. But now, mm-hmm. she says, I woke early one morning and I told myself I wasn't dreaming. That suggests then that it is actually coming out of sleep, not really fully awake. This brings me to the psychological explanations that I've come across. So this mm-hmm. could be entirely a matter of hallucination. There is even this bit of jargon here that describes this. So we have hypnagogia, actually, and we, the one I'm talking about here is hypnopompia, I believe it's called, where it's transition mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. being asleep to being awake. And this particular experience can be accompanied also by sleep 
paralysis where people find they, they can't move for a while uh, before they properly wake up. Now, sure. isn't it possible then that this lady is actually experiencing something like that? She's been heavily influenced by the picture that she saw, her, her experience of, can't remember what it was, breaking up with her boyfriend or whatever it was in this strange situation. She has a dream. She's in this hypnopompic state and it seems very real to her, but in fact, it's entirely a psychological matter. Could that not be the case? Well, I can really see why, you know, why people could think that. Um, but with her case, as well as the other cases that I would give support and evidence for that it is more than that, is simply because she herself described that, you know, during these dreamlike states, transition states between a dreaming and awake, she not only felt the, the presence of this so-called ghost, but she began to receive telepathic communication from him. Mm. You know, he would provide her with certain facts and data that she would go and check out, uh, you know, in the local area and find out these facts were true about this man. Um, others have right. said similar things to that. And also, you often find that these people will also say that they then go on to have these encounters when they're fully awake. Uh, not just in the dream state. And of course, if they're fully awake, and even some of them will say mm. another person was in the room and even witnessed this beginning to happen, then that would certainly imply it wasn't just a hallucination. You know, as I'd said earlier, when a person is experiencing this, very often they'll think of saying the name of Jesus Christ and the experience will eventually stop. Mm. And the terminology, of course, sleep paralysis and so on, of course, this is terminology that doctors have come up with. But if you do actually look at the, the definitions of sleep paralysis from a spiritual point of view, you will begin to recognize many symptoms there within the sleep paralysis umbrella are exactly what people do experience when they're being attacked by demons, um, people who have perhaps then sought exorcism because of it. It's very common for those who are into, say, things like the occult or witchcraft, clairvoyance and so on, to experience these types of symptoms. Again, it would just seem too much of a coincidence to say it's just a hallucination. Yes, it's very easy, isn't it, sometimes to think that because something has a name that therefore it's explained away. It's sleep paralysis or it's hypnopompia or whatever. That doesn't necessarily explain the cause of what's going on. It categorizes the experience in a helpful way. Um, I mean, as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, well, why should it necessarily be one or the other? I mean, why can't it be both in some cases? Why could it not be the case that somebody is open to mm -hmm. some experience? And this could be, to a certain point in their experience, explained fully psychologically. They've had some mm -hmm. emotional experience. They, they have needs in their life and there's something that attracts them and they come out of a dream state and they're, they're having some kind of experience. And then there is an opportunity at that point for whatever being it is, to see an opportunity then to jump into that experience and make more of it, such as you mm -hmm. you then talked about the transferring of information, such that somebody might receive messages and then go and find that those messages are confirmed by looking yes. at archives or whatever it might be, and then they're open to a spiritual realm they wouldn't otherwise have been, an unhelpful spiritual realm mm -hmm. they would otherwise not have been open to. So it seems to me there could be a kind of continuum between the psychological and the spiritual. And indeed, we're both psychological and spiritual beings, so that does make sense. I just want to avoid the mm -hmm. either or. Uh, although in some cases, maybe it is either or. Um, I think one has to look at each, I'm sure you agree with this, look at each yes. case uh, in, in, in well, its yeah, own merits. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's worth perhaps saying at this point, Julian, that, you know, when I was younger, I did undertake um, an honours degree in psychology and, and I was very mm. much interested in psychology. Mm. So, you know, I have that interest there. And basically, yes, you do need to look at all the factors of what someone is claiming and um, discern what's happening with people but I think that it's also quite interesting that many people whatever their faith or spiritual inclinations whether they're a Christian whether they are a witch whatever they're into spiritually will say that in actual fact that those very phases of going into sleep or awaking from sleep those are the times when we tend to be most spiritually open hmm. um, you know often you might hear Christians who say Sometimes they feel that they do receive a revelation from the Lord during that certain period of time 
coming out of sleep or going into sleep, that somehow we're more spiritually open. And of course, it can be either open to the Holy Spirit or to other spirits that can be, as you say, unhelpful. Yes, uh, this is fascinating. Um, I have a quote here from Wikipedia, the dreaded Wikipedia. Um, the reason why I'm going to quote this is simply because the sources that this article is dependent upon, I, I can't get access to without paying. So <laughs> I have to just rely on what is reported here in Wikipedia. So I'm <laughs> I'm hoping this is, is accurate information. Um, it may not be. So take it for what it is. It's a quote from Wikipedia. And this is talking about this hypnagogia. So this is the transition from being awake to going into sleep, where apparently hypnagogic hallucinations can occur. Interestingly, in this quote, they do talk about something which often people will describe as something spiritual, an out-of-body experience. Mm. Now, let me just let, yeah, me, just, let yeah. me just quote this, because I think it's, it's interesting. Um, all right, so hypnagogia can have these things happening to an individual. Um, gustatory, that's taste, olfactory, that's smell, and thermal sensations in hypnagogia have all been reported as well as tactile sensations, including those kinds classed as paresthesia, that sort of tingling, numbness in the fingers, that sort of thing, or formication, that's sort of a sensation of crawling insects on, on, on your skin. Mm. Um, sometimes there is synesthesia. Many people report seeing a flash of light or some other visual image in response to a real sound. Proprioceptive effects may be noticed with numbness and changes in perceived body size and proportions, feelings of floating or bobbing and out of body experiences. Perhaps the most common experience of this kind is the falling sensation and associated hypnic jerk encountered by mm. many people, at least occasionally, while drifting off to sleep. End quote. Now, um, I've experienced that many times <laughs> and it's really weird because I'll be um, just dropping off to sleep and I'll start to dream about something like being on a bicycle mm -hmm. and the bicycle tips over and I put my leg out to stop myself falling over and of course I wake myself up at that point because I've just pushed my leg out. Presumably I'm having that kind of uh, an experience within that umbrella of hypnagogia. Mm -hmm. So there we have a, a mixture of an out-of-body experience which could therefore dovetail into a real spiritual mm -hmm. experience and these phenomena that w one would think are really physical taste smell mm -hmm. heat tactile sensations of actually touching so this term hypnagogia does cover all it seems to me the experiences that are cited by these people of sexual experiences and yet it doesn't really explain what's going on it's a term that says this happens but it doesn't really explain, does it, in itself? Sure. Well, you know, and I suppose that medically minded people, psychologists, psychiatrists and so on, will have all those symptoms listed to them, of course, and have it under that umbrella and explain it as being just something that your mind can um, imagine or your mind can bring about. You hmm. feel you've, you've smelled something and so on, but it's just happening in your mind. But, you know, I understand that, but I would emphasize that you know, I've looked at sleep journals, um, psychological journals to do with sleep studies and so on. You know, top, very clever medics who have researched these things. And so, so interestingly, the symptoms listed are, as I said, often those quoted by people, not just people who have never done anything spiritual, but people who are very much involved in, for example, the occult, astral projection, like you said, people who are very aware that in that certain period of sleep wakefulness that uh, we are more open spiritually and therefore they would claim they are more able to astral project, they are more able to open portals as it were, receive information from spirits and so on. And if we do look at this even cross-culturally and down through the generations, um, we'll see that people like shamans and, and so on from around the world will have reported these things too. It is not a new phenomena at all. You know, some people again may just, you know, say, well, isn't it just a hallucination and so on. Well, it's a very interesting link here because I'm sure we've all heard of people who, um, whether they are, for example, shamans in Africa, India, going away way back in time, who will deliberately take hallucinogenic plants, hallucinogenic drugs, because they feel that when they hallucinate, they do open another portal to let these spirits through. And even today, uh, we know of some mediums, some shamans, some witches and so on, who will take hallucinogenic drugs to open that portal 
to spirits that they tend to communicate with, that they do communicate with anyway, without drugs, but they feel that this hallucinogen empowers the spirits more to come through these so-called portals. So even within that, you can see the links there um, Mm. regarding it. Indeed, so it's possible to orient your psyche in such a way as to be more open to these things. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned other cultures and down the ages. This brings me to the subject of the incubus and the succubus, and there are other mythological characters as well. Do you want to tell us how those connect with the subject we're talking about? Yeah, well, I feel that they do down throughout history and cross-culturally. There have always been reports of these types of experiences where, where people will claim they have been approached by some type of spiritual entity or literally raped by some type of spiritual entity. So, you know, like the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. It's not new phenomena. And oftentimes, as we know, folklore and mythology, you know, is sometimes just um, interesting stories that are fictional. But, but sometimes they will include within that examples of real phenomena that has happened and, and gets woven into the, the mythology mm. or the folklore of a culture. So, yeah, we can see, as you said, Julian, Incubus and Succubus, for example, that's the names given for these spirits that will come and act sexually as if it was a a man towards you or it will act sexually towards you as if it is a female. And even medieval folklore mentioned this. These are Latin words, of course. Um, But Middle Eastern cultures have recorded it as well. Um, And when you look at the reports that often accompanied things like sleep paralysis and so on, and in in recent times, in the last 100 or so years, people have associated the incubus and succubus. They've related it to exorcisms and so on, that Mm. after having exorcism, a person will stop experiencing these things. So it's really something that has been down through history and cross-culturally we can see that this has happened. Now, people's um, interpretations of what exactly those spirits are will differ a great deal. Some people will say, you know, it's just a a naughty spirit. Others will say it's some type of being. um, And others will say what the Bible says, that it is actually a demon. Mm. But the experience certainly has been going on for a great deal of time. And when you mentioned, you know, folklore and so on, there's a similar phenomena as well. Again, we see it cross-culturally and down through time, and that's what would be known as sirens or nymphs. For example, Greek mythology, um, the sirens were mentioned, and these were meant to be spirit beings that lured sailors to them and then would shipwreck them. So these, again, were considered spirits or or some type of spiritual being that really was quite evil. It would uh, seduce the sailors with sexual advances, and yet, really, its ultimate aim was to kill the the sailors. Nymphs, that's another one where where we get the term nymphomania from, actually. And, again, these would be considered some type of female nature deity, water goddesses, and so on. And, you know, we see the exact same type of phenomena happening today, but often the terminology will change when the activity is the same. For example, today, people may... um, claim to have been approached or even raped by a so-called alien or or a so-called nephilim or or snake being or or so on. But again, the activity and the phenomena is exactly the same. And these things stop when the person shouts in Jesus Christ. Mm. Yes, indeed. Very much connecting there to the conversation we had with Joe Jordan. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the name of Jesus is pronounced and these things in many cases will disappear and these things Mm -hmm. will present themselves as whatever the person in their imagination is expecting to see Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting so we have all these different forms in different cultures Um, so I just looked up a few we have the jinn in Arabian culture satyrs in Greek culture boot in Indian culture duzii I don't know how you pronounce that in Celtic culture Um, going back to the incubus and the succubus just to clarify here so the incubus is a a spirit in male form 
who seduces women,、mm-hmm. apparently in order to impregnate those women with its seed、mm-hmm. for whatever reason. And then we have the succubus, which is slightly more complicated. So this is the female form that seduces men, and does so. Again, I'm getting this information from a source that I'm not absolutely sure about, but this is what's reported here.、Mm-hmm. Does this in order to take the seed from men? In order to impregnate women, so rather more complicated thing going on there.、Mm. Now, you know this is very very odd, and I can imagine how myths like this could have developed as ways to explain away unwanted pregnancies. You know, to explain away、yeah. um, mm. disapproved of relationships in a particular culture where there is a child on the scene, and you know you've、mm. got to explain、mm. it away in some way, and you can say, "Oh, the incubus did it, or the succubus yeah, seduced me,"、yeah. that sort of thing. Of course,、yeah. and and no doubt people will have used that as a reason for adultery or unwanted pregnancy. Again, you know, you do have to look at all the the facts and, and discern what's going on, but.、Mm. Sometimes, when that has even been suggested as the real reason, people have came up with evidence and said, "Well, no, actually, because,、uh, for example, my two sisters were also in the room and they also got attacked by this demon, or, or someone else came in the room and witnessed it." So,、mm. <laughs> yeah, each case you do have to look at. Yes, interesting. I was thinking as you were saying that that even if one obviously conceives of these as Originally, mythological characters that may have arisen out of a social need to have a myth to explain away something like an unwanted pregnancy. Once that myth is created,、mm-hmm. that、mm-hmm. idea is out there, and once that idea is believed,、mm-hmm. then that is open for possible manipulation、sure. by some spiritual、yeah. source. So it doesn't necessarily explain it away, even if you've got a kind of sociological、mm-hmm. explanation.、Um, doesn't necessarily explain it away entirely, does it? Sure, and you know, I think that's exactly what. What evil spirits will do? They will capitalise on situations, and for example, as I said, they can transform themselves to appear to look like any type of being. So, you know, if a person, for example, believes in ghosts or aliens or fairies or some new, you know, mythological creature that the person just imagines, a spirit can take on that form, impersonate it, and be that type of being. For that person, again, just because these spirits are evil, they want to deceive people. They want to lead people down these dangerous spiritual routes, and basically, just to get people to doubt the Bible, to get people to doubt Jesus Christ, get people to believe in anything. You know, we often hear jokes that、um, you know atheists will use to try and justify their beliefs, and they'll say, for example, you know, maybe there's a god called the Great Spaghetti Monster. And obviously, they just you know they just use that as an example, and they're making that up, and it's just a joke. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised if someone out there decides maybe there is a great god, spaghetti monster, and, and starts to pray to it. And you know, I would not be surprised at all if an entity appeared in their room, looking like a great spaghetti god, and, and the person then believes it all the more because they would appear to have this evidence when in fact it is just a spirit. Masquerading as if it is that actual entity. That would be wonderfully ironic in a way if that sort of thing were to happen, wouldn't it?、Um, okay. Well, we could say surely that many of these cases which come out in the media and which are therefore high profile are there essentially for gaining attention. They're lies. People are trying to make a name for、mm-hmm. themselves. They're trying to get interviews and sell books and become a celebrity. Can't we explain a lot of it away that way? Well, yes, but before I answer that properly, I'd like to just go back a little. You mentioned the incubus and succubus、mm. definition that some people believe these beings are either passing on sperm or receiving sperm. That is certainly more controversial. But there are some Christians who say, well, this could be entirely possible because they will refer to, for example, passages in the Bible that would seem to imply this can happen. They will refer to Genesis six and the Nephilim story,、mm. uh, where they believe it really was demons that had sex with humans and produced offspring. But that is a controversial interpretation because other Christians will say, no, it doesn't really mean demons at all. It actually just means a giant race of people. But I just thought I'd put that in there in case anyone's heard of that.、Um, yes, certainly that needs to be mentioned in in the conversation.、Um, my position, which long-time listeners will know, is that is a very difficult passage, a very obscure passage 
to interpret. Um, yes. I've, I've talked about that a couple of times before in the podcast. So I won't go into mm. any detail about that, but I'm, I'm not inclined to go with the sure, kind of interpretation sure. that you've just mentioned there. Although I do understand that other people do have different mm-hmm. views on that. Um, I share that, I share that view, Julian. I, I tend to think it does just mean giant people rather than giant, i.e. demons. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, yeah, I don't really want to get into the subject in itself because no, it will, course. you know, go off at a tangent. But, um, sure. my question is, really an interpretive one as to, or rather a hermeneutical one, as to quite how we're supposed to read that text, to what extent we're supposed to understand that to be talking about actual history, to what extent it is polemical, using materials from other cultures in order to make Mm -hmm. polemical points against those cultures in contradistinction to the work of God yeah, within yeah. within his own people. So, you know, there are lots of questions like that. Absolutely. So um, I tend to avoid that one because it is so controversial. I have so many questions in my own mind about I it. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> so getting back to this question about lies, don't you think that a lot of the high profile stuff is a bunch of lies? Well, um, again, I would say, you know, like yourself, we should look at all angles of something, not just believe mm. whatever's reported. And no doubt there will have been some people who have lied or just had a, a nightmare and imagined it. Um, but again, I would say look at the stories that are reported by, for example, movie stars and singers who have reported these things. Look at the symptoms that they're listing and you will always see For those cases that are genuine, you will always see a trend there which ticks the boxes showing you that this is a spiritual phenomena. And often the person themselves will happen to mention that they are into things like New Age or spiritualism or the esoteric Mm. mystical things. Or that even if they're not, that their parents were, for example, Mm. or their grandparents were, or their flatmate is. And oftentimes, as we know, the Bible will say, you know, people can experience spiritual things simply because their great-grandparents were involved in something like that, and it's a hmm. what the Bible calls a curse that comes down the generations. So, yeah, I would look at each story and assess it. Yeah, but that makes me wonder whether, let's just say you are somebody in public life and your career is, well, it's a bit mediocre mm-hmm. at the moment, so you need to sort of spice it up a little bit, and okay, you're into the new age, you're into the occult, or, and, and so therefore you, you know about this terminology, you, you've heard about people having these experiences, and you think, hey, if I say something like that, then yeah, that will get me more talk shows, and I'll perhaps write a few books about it, and my, my career will improve as a consequence of that. Yeah, well, well, maybe some of them do, and um, <laughs> yeah. you know, who yeah. knows if, if someone's lying or, or telling the truth? But I guess that's between them and God. Sure, and, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I'm not saying this. This is just something that explains everything away. I'm just sure. No, I do. Uh, yeah, just wonder about these people who have become high-profile cases about it. I do think that in itself somehow makes me wonder: Why do you want to get on TV and talk about this? Are you after your 15 minutes of fame? And um, let me just go to this case here of. Uh, could be, but could I also say, Julian, sure. that, you know, going back to my own experience when I was a spiritualist and I was into New Age, that um, when you do believe in these things, you know, you, you think it's a good thing to be communicating with spirit guides and, and ghosts and so on, and mm. you feel your life has improved from it, so you want to let others know about it. And some of these people who have went on TV or, or, or spoken to the media, the tabloids and so on, will admit it's because they themselves are a spiritualist medium. They do tend to work with ghosts anyway, and they just want to educate the public that this is a real phenomena. Mm. Yeah, okay. So they want other people to experience this as well because they believe it's a good thing. Okay, so let me throw this at you. Mm-hmm. Why isn't it a good thing? I, mean, I, I agree with you. <laughs> so I'm just playing devil's advocate here. So, okay, why isn't it a good thing? They hear about this. People think, yeah, let's dabble in this as well. Aren't their lives going to be improved by it? Um, well, there was a woman also at, at the end of last year who was on uh, this morning program in the UK, which obviously is watched by you know people right across the UK. It went on to YouTube and the internet. It was picked up by many of the papers and magazines, not just in the UK but around the world. And she did say that she was a, a medium. Um, her name was Amethyst Realm, hmm. and she said that she had had twenty different ghost lovers through the years and that she preferred having these sexual relationships with ghosts rather than alive uh, men 
this to her was an option, you know, a good option, and that she wanted to go that way. And so people might argue, well, why not? You know, let her do that. What difference does it make? She's got a right to have sex with who she wants to. Of course she does. But, you know, I would say even within the supernatural paranormal realm, there are many mediums and psychics and channelers and so on who would actually warn about this and who would say this is very dangerous because sometimes spirits turn up and it's really a, a wicked, evil spirit and it's pretending to be a ghost of someone. So therefore, you're, you're actually having sex with this entity that's not the young man that you think it is or the young woman that you think it is. Um, again, myself, when I was a spiritualist back in the day and all down through history, when you look at the spiritualist type literature, there is a phenomenon where mediums will even admit that these so-called mischievous spirits can impersonate a ghost. Uh, of course, I would say they're all impersonating ghosts because they are all demons. But even within the realm of clairvoyance, they recognize that this is a phenomenon. So I would say that hmm. I, I'm kind of surprised that that young woman hasn't thought of that, hasn't realized that these so-called ghosts are not who they claim to be. And I would urge anyone who is involved in this or, or even thinking about it as an option to think again because you may think you're having sex with this young, handsome, dead person and it's not who you're claiming to be. Do you really want to get involved in something like that? And mm. especially when, um, as I said before, many people who have been involved in these things and then don't want to have sex with this so-called ghost anymore find out the ghost will start to rape them uh, you know, and attack them against their will. So is this really a, an option that, that, that you want to experiment with? Yes, indeed. And uh, I can imagine how it could end up destroying your life because you could look back after so many years thinking, well, I was deceived by that and I didn't have the kind of relationship with another human being that I'm designed to have, Absolutely. didn't have a family and missed out or whatever because mm -hmm. of this delusion that I allowed myself mm -hmm. to be persuaded by. Yeah, I see that it's a very serious thing. Um Okay, well, just going back to this idea of people just lying about things, I don't want to actually say this lady has lied, because I don't know, but it did strike me as a possibility. This is uh, the lady called Amanda Teague, who has married a ghost of a 300-year-old pirate, so she says. Mm -hmm. She found somebody who would, um, some medium who would marry her um, in international waters, so as to avoid the laws of, I think it's the UK, in fact. And uh, she calls this character Jack after Captain Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean, played by Johnny Depp. So she obviously has a bit of a crush on Johnny Depp. And at the end of the story about this, I noticed it said that she and Jack are now co-writing a book about their relationship with advice for other people to find a soulmate on the other side of the grave. And I thought, yeah, you're writing a book about it. That suggests to me that this is not genuine. But of course, I don't know. But that's how it strikes me. Well, I can see why you, you would think that, Julian, but she actually struck me as being very genuine in what she was saying. Right. I just feel because she was saying that she was a medium, hmm. you know, so she was used to talking with ghosts. She did actually say that she didn't actually know who Johnny Depp was, that when she described oh, she? the ghost to oh. her daughter, I think it was, her daughter said, that sounds just like Johnny hmm. Depp. Okay. Um, so I don't think she was just making it up. And as I said, there was a medium at the wedding who was apparently channeling this ghost so that they could say their vows. So again, the, the medium was doing this, and I doubt very much the medium was making it up. I'm pretty sure she was in contact with a spirit that was pretending to be this pirate. Um, mm. The story to me just sounds like she's genuinely as a medium who wants to spread the message of clairvoyance and the message of relationships with ghosts, and that's why she's writing a book. You know, when I was a spiritualist, I had ambitions to write books about the phenomena, and it is a common thing that mediums will want to spread their message. I know we can never be completely sure about someone, but I happen to believe that, that, that the woman genuinely had experienced those things. Okay, fair enough. It's just how I initially responded to the story when I read it, and perhaps partly the way the story is actually written, of course. One which had more impact upon me, because I actually saw the person interviewed, and the seriousness with which he conducted himself, was David Huggins. Mm -hmm. So this is from the TV programme this morning, under Hot Topics, <laughs> um, from February 2018, and it's 
it's actually called I Lost My Virginity to an Alien Called Crescent. So this is a 74-year-old guy from New Jersey. He has this alien partner he calls Crescent, and he claims to have children with her. And this experience began at the age of eight when he was on a farm, and he there, there was this, what he describes as a hairy guy with glowing eyes, sort of came out of the, the blue shouting his name. Um, but since then, he's had many alien encounters that he calls alien encounters. And at the age of 17, he had this sexual experience with Crescent. Crescent wears a black wig and has a humanoid body. And he says that he has fathered, well, one report says 60 odd, another report says hundreds indeed of alien babies. And he says he's seen them. He's seen them stacked in, in cases on top of each other. Now, this sounds absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. And I obviously don't believe it at face value. Mm. However, he seemed to come over as very serious, very genuine. He is an artist. He spends his, you know, free time, as it were, um, drawing and painting these characters. They look very much like the, the classical greys. And he's been doing this for years and years. Is he a madman? Is he a victim of some abuse in the past? Is he being deceived by spirits? Or... I have to say it, is mm -hmm. he actually painting the actual truth? Um, again, you know, as you say, we need to examine each case and what's going on here. Interestingly, you, you mentioned Joseph Jordan. Mm. He is an expert on the whole phenomena of alien contactees and alien so-called abductions. He's been on my radio show quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you worldwide people have claimed mm. to have contacted or had sex with aliens, these beings from different galaxies and so on. Um, it's just the type of stuff we mentioned earlier, the, the type of symptoms that a person will list when they are uh, involved in this type of thing. And again, um, people have used the name of Jesus Christ to stop these things happening. Um, I had two people actually on my radio show who had been attacked by aliens or sexually approached by aliens and they did stop when they came to Jesus Christ and um, yes. prayed to him that the phenomena stopped. So I would personally argue that it's just the same phenomena in a new package, if you like, that these are these demonic fallen beings the Bible talks about and that they are able to masquerade looking like these alien beings from other dimensions, mm. whether it be greys, whether it be Pleiadians or Syrians or the host of other so-called beings from planets. Um mm. But like you say, I would be hesitant to say that the pregnancies definitely happened. And I know that many people claim that that has happened. Um, I can't be 100% sure, of course, mm. but I would tend to suggest what's happened is demons are, you know, can create the most incredible visions and the most incredible sights and experiences. I believe that these so-called pregnancies or babies that have been born it is actually just a delusion the demon has hmm. put the person under that they haven't actually been pregnant or produced a child at all. Of course, I can't prove that, but that's my interpretation no, of it. Sure. Yes, I tend to agree. I mean, with my cynical hat on, I would be tempted to think, well, this guy is an artist. If you're going to be successful in the art world, you've got to find an angle. Is that what he's done? Has he found, oh yes, this is the kind of thing that's going to cause a bit of a stir and I'm going to be famous this way and it's worked for him to some extent. But again, he doesn't come over that way. I mean, you'd have to be incredibly cynical to do something like that and mm -hmm. he just doesn't come over that way. So my tendency is to agree with you that he is genuinely experiencing something and most plausibly, we would both agree, being Christian theists, that you know, this is some spirit or collection of spirits that are antagonistic towards God's purposes who are creating these visions in this man and mm -hmm. as a consequence probably distracting him from what he should be experiencing, which is a loving, living relationship with the God who is there. And I presume he's not. I mean, I don't know anything about him beyond mm -hmm. what's reported, but his life seems to be obsessed with mm -hmm. this experience. I would agree with you there, Julian, and I do feel that, again, when you look at any of these um, experiences that people have had, one of the, the features that, that can be quite common across the range of experiences is that whatever the entity is claiming to be, that it will also want to teach the person spiritual things. And oftentimes, the so-called beings or ghosts or aliens will teach them 
any manner of spiritual things like we all came from another planet or, you know, we're all yep. reincarnated from planet such and such and the real name of God is blah, 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 or even Lucifer, and that they will not acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Savior. They will say that the Bible is false and so on. Um, and that, again, is another alarm bell. Why would all these entities want to teach a person that? And if these people do turn to Jesus Christ and ask him into their lives and follow him as their Savior, that these experiences can be stopped. Mm, Sometimes, mm. though, it, is, it doesn't stop right away by using the name of Jesus and the person actually has to have exorcism. Um, and after that, the experiences stop. And again, as you say, I believe it's just a, a distraction. These false deities, false gods and so on, it's just a distraction to make people doubt the Bible, doubt Jesus Christ and therefore not come into that loving, mm. eternal mm. relationship with him. That certainly does make sense. My last question to you has to be, okay, I can see that this is serious for people who are involved in it, but is it really worth talking about it to the length that you do talk about it? You say this is your fourth or fifth interview about it, because, I mean, are really many people going to be interested in this? I mean, it's out there, it's on the internet, it's on TV mm -hmm. shows, but are people really going to be attracted to this? Because it's pretty way out, it's a pretty bizarre thing. Mm -hmm. In many people's minds, I should think it would just be laughable. Yeah, and many people will laugh at it and totally disregard it. But I think specifically because in recent years, well, you know, even from the 80s up to currently, we do see an increase in the amount of celebrities who are willing to talk about this, whether that's Hollywood actors and actresses or or singers and so on, uh, you know, and very often people will listen to what they have to say, especially um, teenagers, for example, and there is indeed, shockingly, quite a range of websites out there that actually teach how to have sex with ghosts or aliens, uh, spectrophilia, same. as it's called, right. and how to summon um, these entities. Right. So it has become, I would say, an option for people, you know, exploring their sexuality and so on. Why not try this? And the fact that there are so many websites about it would, would certainly imply to me your average person might not know about it. Many people might not even admit to doing it, but that behind closed doors people are online and um, trying this out because it has become an option. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine how this could be hugely destructive mm -hmm. to people who do get involved in this on, on a number of levels. I don't think we need to spell out what those could be. It seems pretty obvious to me that this could be very, very destructive for mm -hmm. people, even if it's just a few people getting involved. But of course, if you, you suggest if there are many websites out there, probably there are quite a lot of people getting involved in this, even if in terms of the percentage of the population, it's very small. Um, so I think it is worth talking mm -hmm. about it. I, and I, you, know, I, you know, it is so easy to think that this was too taboo, we shouldn't be talking about this. Sure. Um, we started the conversation saying we didn't want to be sensationalist, mm -hmm. and we, we don't. And I hope that people have understood that throughout the conversation, that we are concerned about this, we're trying to understand what's going on, and to warn people about getting involved in this kind of thing, because whatever is going on, it's not healthy, it's not helpful, no. and there could be a very dark side to this in some cases. So it's, you know, leave well alone, because God is there and wants to have this relationship with us and wants us, of course, to, to live according to the design plan that yes. God has put in place, which is that we should have relationships with other human beings, you know, in, in the obvious way that we're designed to be. So thank you, Laura. Um, I know there's something you want to say, um, so I'm going to let you say that before I actually close off. Go on, what did you want to say? Yeah, I would, you know, recommend if anyone has experienced this or knows of someone who's experienced mm. it and wants to be free to check out. There's a couple of websites you mentioned yourself, Julian, Joseph Jordan mm. and Guy Malone, mm. and their website is at alienresistance.org. And there's also a video and a book by Chris White, that's called Sleep Paralysis, What It Is and How to Stop It. Now, um, although that's the title, the facts given there on how to stop it applies to any type of uh, spiritual attack, you know, including this, this uh, phenomena. Yes, indeed. Yes, I've learned something in, indeed from Chris White's ministry in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good source indeed, as indeed the other sources are that you mentioned there. Actually, I've just thought of one question that I must ask you before we close. In cases where people, they know of people who are involved in this sort of thing, 
how on earth do you go about helping somebody in that situation? It's such a delicate issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, I would tend to say to suggest to them testimonies of people who have been through it and who have discovered it was not really a ghost, but was actually a demon masquerading. Mm. And, for example, the websites that, that I listed and how the person yeah. got free from it, how they found out it wasn't really a ghost. And they might not believe the Bible interpretation mm. at first, but I think when they hear how a person's life can be so transformed they may reconsider. My own mother, for example, as I say, she was a spiritualist medium and she committed suicide because she did not get free mm. of being raped by so-called ghosts and so on. Um, but of course, I found Jesus yeah. Christ and I did get set free from that type of thing. Indeed, indeed, yes. And there we are, example of something that can go seriously wrong, seriously dark, um, indeed. And the answer, as you say, is faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, throughout this conversation, you have mentioned how the name can actually produce freedom. And this is something that Joe said time and again. People think, well, these are aliens, but funnily enough, it's the name of Jesus that can actually produce this freedom from this experience. I think that, that's, I've certainly found that very persuasive myself that there's something spiritual going on yes. in, in many of these cases anyway as i said before thank you ever so much laura for coming on this second time it's been a fascinating conversation a difficult one um didn't know quite how we was going to navigate this one but yes. I, I think we've we've done okay with it i think people understand what we're trying to do here um I so. and i do in fact hope that people will find this helpful just having talked about something which many mm -hmm. people would mm -hmm. consider taboo um but it is important to air such yes. things yes. so thank you very much indeed laura and um just lastly can you give us the address of your website so that people can go there? Ourspiritualquest.com and you'll find my TV radio interviews on there and a host of other articles by other people. Great. Thanks ever so much again. Look forward to speaking to you again at some point. Thanks, Julian. God bless. 